Hello, welcome. It's the ninth Sunday after the Feast of the Holy Trinity. And the reading set for this Sunday Eucharist is from St. Matthew chapter 14. It begins at verse 22. Jesus has just fed the crowd miraculously. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the, up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there all alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking towards them on the lake. But when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those on the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is one of those passages that causes some modern Christians difficulties. In fact, there are a number of places in the Gospel that cause people difficulties. I remember when I first became a Christian, sitting down and reading about the feeding of the 5,000 and thinking it would be so much easier to believe this if, if what had happened was everyone had brought a picnic and under Jesus' benign influence they had pulled their secret sandwiches out of their back pockets and, and shared them. That's not what the text says, of course. And then you have the texts like the one we've just read where Jesus walks on the water and it's perfectly clear that the disciples invite you either to believe or disbelieve. There is no other way. Contemporary Christianity has been very badly wounded by the influence of some theologians, particularly a German school of theology, who tried to squeeze the Gospels into a kind of Newtonian rational box and to say that, that anything that appeared to be miraculous or outside the ordinary was clearly inserted in there to make a good impression. But of course this isn't how it works. Um, the Gospel writers wrote these things down because they were overwhelmed by the reality of them and the experience. Not because they were setting out to try and get people to believe in a certain kind of Jesus. And so the Jesus in the Gospels is always bigger than our mind is inclined to manage very well. Our minds are rather odd places. Some of them are a bit small, a little bit prejudiced. We have our own preferences. And when we read about Jesus in the Gospels, we find that either we have to let the figure of Jesus expand our minds and our categories, or our minds close him out. And we have to make that choice. So if you have chosen to allow the Jesus of history, the Jesus of the Gospels, to expand your mind, then then you have this kind of Jesus, one who sees the disciples in trouble and comes straight toward them. If, if you've ever been in a boat on a, on a shore and you're being driven off it, uh, you'll know, and the Sea of Galilee it can be a terrifying place in a storm, you'll know that the boat and the lake are not a safe place to be, even though the disciples were hardy professionals. People drowned, boats overturned, Storms overcame fishermen. What's extraordinary here is that Jesus makes a beeline for his disciples to save them. You remember at the end of the story, he gets in the boat and suddenly the storm ceases. There's an element one might think of, of spiritual contest in this. It is as if without Jesus in the boat, the dynamic elements of the spiritual world, the demonic elements one might say, attack the disciples and Jesus comes to their rescue and saves them. But in doing so, he walks on the water. 
And then Peter has this extraordinary experience. And of course, in so many ways, we are Peter. Peter in the Gospels has a very endearing characteristic. If there's something to be tried, some mark to step up to, then in his open-hearted enthusiasm, he is there. And then he finds that actually he can't deliver. He falls flat on his face. Of course, the most serious moment is when he tells Jesus he will never deny him. And then shortly after that, as he's asked who he is, and if he has anything to do with Jesus, he says, absolutely not. I don't know the man. Jesus will come to him and put it right by asking him three times if he wants he, Peter, to have anything to do with Jesus. And Peter, irritated, annoyed, embarrassed, purged and helped, says, yes, I do. And here now, the disciples, they have their own preset categories, <clears throat> their own universe where they have certain assumptions about what can and what can't happen. And as far as they're concerned, this figure on the water has to be some kind of spirit, some ghost, some some terrible phenomenon they don't know anything about, and they're terrified. And then, above the wind and the noise of the water, Peter catches Jesus' voice and says, Lord, if it's you, let me come to you. Goodness knows what made him say that. I mean, of all the things he could have settled for Jesus getting into the boat, calming the storm, and, and uh, getting safely back. So Jesus says, yes, okay, come to me. And Peter starts. He climbs out of the boat. Well, if you're a sailor, you don't just climb out of the boat. This is extraordinary, but he does. And the sea, the lake, is solid under his feet. And he begins to walk towards Jesus. And now he has category confusion because he knows he's walking towards Jesus. He knows Jesus is reaching out his arms to him. And then he takes his eyes off Jesus and looks round and, Jesus, and Peter the fisherman says, this can't be happening. I'm in the middle of a terrible storm and the noise frightens him. And in his fear, he looks down and taking his eyes off Jesus, he begins to fall. Jesus calls him and invites him to look back into his eyes and he reaches out his hand and holds him. I think one of the best commentators on the dynamics involved in this relationship with Jesus, which we all share, one where we're looking at him, we're willing to trust him, and we sense his presence in the storm, we're willing to follow him, and yet something in us panics, and we, and, and we take our eyes off him, look down, and we crash. C.S. Lewis explained why this might be. In his Screwtape Letters, we have the senior devil writing to the junior devil. And in this, in this wonderful medium, Lewis can say some pretty outrageous things about the struggle between good and evil without anyone getting too upset. Because after all, he's asking you not to take him too seriously. Although after a while, you realize he's asking you to take him deadly seriously. My dear Wormwood, so you have great hopes the patient's religious phase is dying away, have you? I always thought the training college had gone to pieces since they put old Slubbergat at the head of it. Now I'm sure. Has no one ever told you about the law of undulation? Humans are amphibians, half spirit and half animal. The enemy's determination to produce such a revolting hybrid was one of the things that determined our father in hell, that's the devil, to withdraw his support from him, our father in heaven. As spirits, they belong to the eternal world, but as animals, they inhabit time. And this means that while their spirit can be directed to an eternal object, their bodies, passions, and imagination are in continual change, for to be in time means to change. Their nearest approach to constancy, therefore, is undulation, the repeated return to a level from which they repeatedly fall back. Well, this doesn't just have to be a crisis for us to experience the trauma that Peter experienced. For, uh, as we're told, half of us lives in time. 
And living in time, things change. They are in flux. They get warmer, they get colder. They get nearer, they get farther. That's what it is to be in the flesh in time. Part of us, when we've accepted Christ, particularly, is enhanced, is in the spirit. Our hearts belong to God. They belong in heaven. They belong out of time. We feel, as Lewis will go on to say elsewhere, very awkward in time. It either goes too fast or too slow. We know we don't quite belong. We are amphibian. We swim in the spirit. We walk in time. And so we find ourselves with this duality of experience in us. There are times when we see Jesus, know Jesus, feel Jesus, are inspired by him, and know we belong in the kingdom of heaven. And we just have to make our way through this jungle, this undergrowth, as we press on towards the end, which are our deaths and our rebirth. And there are other times when the whole thing goes very dull, when it becomes dry and inaccessible, unreal. And we wonder how we could have been so silly as to have been caught. Was it an over-fertile imagination? Was it some kind of projection as Feuerbach and Freud used to threaten us with? What, what was it that made us get caught up in this imaginative childhood of spirit? Except that we constantly come back to it, this period of undulation. We are drawn back up into the spirit where we experience ecstasy and the numinous and the glorious. Our hearts are strangely warmed. We know God made us and loved us and saved us and we fall away again. Of course, this is partly the law of undulation, partly because we are in time as amphibians, but partly also the forces that overwhelm the disciples' boat are forces that are ranged against us. We too find ourselves in storms that are not wholly natural. They are aimed against us by, by a force, by an energy who wants to drag us back down into the animal underworld where our souls will become numb and lost forever. And what is the antidote to that? Well, it is to do what Peter did. It is to look into the eyes of Jesus. And that's why it's so important as part of our daily routine to pray. Lewis said, the moment your feet touch the ground in the morning, pray, pray the Our Father. As you wake up and come fuzzily into consciousness, thank God you're alive and that you still have time, that you have the opportunity to stride through the undergrowth towards him. We find ourselves in these two worlds, with these two part of ourselves. What would we be like if we were only animal, if we only understood ourselves in a biological way? All the resources of the kingdom of heaven would be lost to us. When the scriptures tell us that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, these, these are the aspects of our humanity that are amplified when that part of us which is spirit is alive and breathing well in prayer, in love and in obedience. So as Christ invites us out of the boat to walk through the storm, through the conflict towards him, if we drop our eyes away from him, we can all too easily find ourselves really very frightened. I know periods when I feel immensely alarmed because if what I'm going to do is going to be done in my own strength and my own capacities, to tell you the truth, I am a very flawed and fragile human being. Like Peter, I crash on my face endlessly. <clears throat> like him, I reach out for our Lord and I find myself tripping myself up and flat on my face. And if it wasn't for the fact that our Lord offers us forgiveness and the promise that he continues to believe in us, and bring us back to the point we long to be, which is in his arms, in his hands, and safe. Why? We would give up. And so every day we're invited to do our humanity in the spirit, not in the flesh. In the kingdom of heaven, not in the world. To breathe in the oxygen of heaven, not the carbon dioxide of earth. 
every day we're invited to love with Christ's help. And when we love people with Christ's help, then their capacity for annoying us and for our turning our backs on them and closing our hearts to them is greatly diminished because Christ's love takes us places by ourselves we would never and could never have gone. The joy that the kingdom of heaven brings is the most extraordinary thing. One can see sometimes in people's faces they have never known this joy. There's a kind of flat two-dimensionalness to some people's faces. But those who know Christ, well, to begin with, their eyes go back a lot further than those who don't. There is a holy joy which wells up in them from time to time, quite unlike any mirth or entertainment the world can give. It's just joy for joy's sake. And the peace that Christ offers, the peace of belonging and being forgiven, of being believed in, of being given a purpose, that kind of peace goes far deeper than any of the stroking that the gifts of our secular society can offer us, opportunities to exercise power uh, or wealth or, or sex or influence. These things evaporate so quickly and they're never ours. They're unreliable. But the peace that Christ gives us as we look, in, look into his eyes is of an entirely different dimension. And so we are Peter. And in the storm of our lives, Christ asks us to come to him. To deal in categories that so far go far beyond what we ourselves can manage and come to him. And as we do, we find ourselves terrified, alarmed, and we look down and we sink and he reaches out. Peter was supposedly a very stocky, very tough fisherman. How strong Christ must have been just to reach him out and to gather him up into his arms on the solid ground underneath Christ's feet. And so the invitation is stay in touch with Jesus, look into his eyes, say your prayers, believe in him, breathe in the life of the Spirit and his love. Use that amphibian part of yourself that belongs in heaven. And not that rather crumbly part of yourself that gets creakier by the day and will, of course, eventually simply crumble into dust as the entropy of our biology just collapses. We have the choice. We were born in heaven, in the imagination and in the love of the Father who knew us in the womb. We are rescued by Christ who comes towards us and then gives us this new birth in the Spirit. And now we cultivate that life in the Spirit. We've learned to breathe in a different medium. But we have to practice it and continue it. For the love of heaven is our oxygen. And what we find on earth gets increasingly stuffier and is our carbon dioxide. So whenever you fall flat on your face, whenever you panic, whenever you're frightened, whenever the gravity of our circumstances overcomes you, open the Gospels, open your heart, and look into the eyes of Jesus, for he reaches out to hold you, to love you, and to rescue you, and to carry you home. You will never be alone again. You will be never left to fall or fail on your own. This is the gospel. This is why we call it good news. This is why we get up every day to offer our Lord praise and thanksgiving. To his name be the glory forever and ever. Amen.